the lunar landings were more than likely fabricated, faked. I affirm that we didn't go to the moon, and I would bet my life on it. In 1969, we were able to go to the moon, and here we are over three decades later, and we can barely get to low Earth orbit. And I think by any measure, that is a step backwards. Unlike many other skeptics, Elon Musk has often said that Apollo 11 was one of the most inspiring achievements in all of human history, an event he considers not only a triumph of technology, but one of the few moments that was universally good for humanity. It deeply influenced him. Yet he also expressed disappointment that year after year, we seemed poised to surpass Apollo but never did. That lingering stagnation, he said, made him feel a deep sadness about the future. Given all the technological advancements we've made, it's strange that we still haven't sent humans back to the moon. More than 50 years have passed since Apollo 11, yet the debate about the moon landing continues. Was it a genuine triumph of human ingenuity or just an elaborate Hollywood-style illusion? To support the idea that the moon landing was faked, conspiracy theorists have put forward a number of claims. One of the most popular early theories is known as the second light source theory. Take a look at the image below. Notice the shadows cast by astronaut Neil Armstrong and another nearby object. What stands out? The shadows are not parallel. Conspiracy theorists argue that this proves the moon landing was staged. If the sun were the only light source, they claim, then the shadows should be perfectly parallel. To them, this suggests the scene was filmed in a studio using multiple light sources, which caused the differing shadow angles. However, this theory does not hold up under closer scrutiny. The effect in the photo is actually a result of perspective. When we reduce a three-dimensional scene to a two-dimensional image, parallel lines can appear to converge or diverge. Artists have understood and used this visual trick for centuries. Today, anyone with a smartphone or digital camera can test this themselves. Go outside when the sun is low in the sky, and you will see that even then, shadows cast by objects at different angles will not appear perfectly parallel, just like in the Apollo 11 photos. Another common theory is that the lunar modules should have left blast craters, or at least some obvious signs of dust being blown around. I mean, they were big, powerful machines. Shouldn't there be a noticeable mark where they landed? Well, not really. And there is a pretty good scientific reason for that. The descent engine on the lunar module, which had about 10,000 pounds, or 4,500 kilograms of thrust, was actually throttled way down during the final part of the landing. By that point, it was not trying to slow the spacecraft down anymore. It was just gently supporting its weight. And remember, gravity on the moon is much weaker than on Earth, and most of the fuel had already been used up, so the module was lighter too. At touchdown, the pressure from the engine was not nearly enough to blast out a crater. It was only around 1.5 PESI, or 10 kilopascals. On top of that, in the vacuum of space, rocket exhaust spreads out really quickly after it leaves the nozzle. That is very different from how it behaves on Earth, where the atmosphere keeps the exhaust more focused. If you have ever watched a rocket launch, you have probably seen how the plume spreads out more the higher it goes. So, while there was not a dramatic crater under the lander, there definitely was some effect. Video from the mission shows dust being blown around during landing, and the astronauts even talked about how it reduced visibility. Some photos also show scouring on the surface where the lander came in at a slight angle. And here is one more important point. The lunar surface, called regolith, is very compact, just below the loose top layer of dust. So even if there was a strong blast, it would not dig deep into the ground like it might on Earth. In fact, scientists later measured that the engine only eroded about 4 to 6 inches, or 100 to 150 millimeters, of material directly under the lander. So yes, the engine did disturb the surface, just not in the dramatic crater-blasting way conspiracy theorists expected. Perhaps one of the most common arguments from people who believe the moon landings were faked involves the Van Allen radiation belts. These are two large donut-shaped zones of charged particles surrounding Earth. One is made of high-energy protons, and the other consists mostly of lower-energy electrons. Skeptics claim that no human could survive passing through them without receiving a lethal dose of radiation. 
That concern was taken seriously before the Apollo missions, but NASA planned carefully. The key is that the spacecraft did not linger in the belts. They passed through the inner belt in just a few minutes and the outer belt in about an hour and a half. The spacecraft's aluminum hull provided some shielding and the flight path avoided the most dangerous regions. Radiation readings from all nine moon missions showed that astronauts received an average dose of about 0.46 rad. This is not a dangerous amount. It is less than what some nuclear workers are exposed to, though higher than what medical workers typically receive when handling x-rays. Even James Van Allen, who discovered the belts, dismissed claims that the radiation would have made the missions impossible. In fact, the Apollo data confirmed that the precautions worked, the astronauts stayed safe, and the missions went ahead as planned. So obviously, the moon landing was real. If it had been faked, 50 years would have been more than enough time for someone to prove it. Even if the U.S. government somehow managed to keep it secret, what about the rest of the world? Countries like Russia, China, Japan, and India have all sent orbiters and landers to the moon, and not one of them has claimed the U.S. faked it. In fact, several of their spacecraft have captured images of the Apollo landing sites, showing hardware still sitting on the surface. But even setting aside all the technical evidence, there is one point that people who lived through the Apollo era often bring up, and it makes a lot of sense. When the Soviets launched Sputnik 1 in 1957, followed just a month later by Sputnik 2 with the dog Laika, the U.S. space program barely existed. NASA was not even founded until 1958. The first American astronaut, Alan Shepard, did not fly until 1961. Then, out of nowhere, President John F. Kennedy announced that the U.S. would land a man on the moon and return him safely by the end of the decade. And somehow, just eight years later, in 1969, the U.S. not only landed astronauts on the moon, but did it multiple times, with apparent success each time. Well, you know how we did it? We threw a huge amount of money, people, and urgency at it. By the mid-60s, NASA was eating up almost 5% of the entire U.S. federal budget. To put that in perspective, today NASA gets less than 1%. And that has to cover everything from Mars missions to climate satellites. We were moving fast, and that meant the safety standards were nowhere near what we would consider acceptable today. That rush led to tragedy. On January 27, 1967, during a routine test on the launch pad, a fire broke out inside the Apollo 1 command module. Three astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, were killed. The mission wasn't even supposed to launch for another few weeks. The fire forced a total overhaul of the spacecraft design and a long pause in crewed missions. Honestly, if something like that happened at the start of a program today, there is a good chance the whole thing would get canceled. But back then, the U.S. was in a race, and stopping simply was not an option. Thankfully, NASA figured things out. And in 1969, they landed Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon with Michael Collins orbiting above. Mission accomplished. Here is the thing. All of that work, the successes and the failures, the blueprints, the mission plans, the engineering notes, they are still around. Maybe not in filing cabinets anymore, but digitally, yes. You can actually find tons of that information online, publicly available. It is not a secret. But if all that stuff is still out there, why can't we just dust off the plans, rebuild the Saturn V, and go back to the moon like we did 50 years ago? Well, technically, yes. We could rebuild the Saturn V if we threw enough money at it. But the real question is, why would we? Elon Musk has said more than once that repeating Apollo would feel like a sad remake of a classic 1960s movie. It would never capture the same sense of glory and wonder as the original. His point is that we need to aim higher. In one of his recent talks at Starbase, Elon mentioned his vision of building a base on the moon called Moonbase Alpha. That is also what NASA is aiming for. This time, the goal is not just flags and footprints. It is about building something more permanent, a base for science experiments and exploration, and as a stepping stone for future missions to Mars, which is Musk's ultimate destination. There is also a growing interest in mining the moon for resources. Recent discoveries have shown that some of the moon's larger craters may hold metal oxides, 
scientists also believe there are reserves of silicon, titanium, rare earth metals, and aluminum beneath the surface. These are essential materials for modern technology, and there is growing pressure to find alternatives to relying on countries like China, which currently controls about a third of the world's known reserves. Another big reason countries are turning their eyes to the moon is helium-3. In theory, helium-3 could be the key to unlocking nuclear fusion, often called the holy grail of clean energy. Fusion produces much more energy than nuclear fission and comes with far fewer radioactive byproducts. The problem is, on Earth, helium-3 is extremely rare. Only about 0.0001% of helium here is helium-3, but the moon might have millions of tons of it. Ouyang Ziyuan, the chief scientist of China's lunar exploration program, has said that if we can harness helium-3, it could meet humanity's energy needs for the next 10,000 years. Going to the moon is also a unique way to learn more about Earth. Unlike Earth, the moon is geologically stable, lacking plate tectonics, atmosphere, and active erosion. In this sense, it is a quiet, static place that is ideal for preserving ancient materials. If fragments of Earth were blasted into space by powerful asteroid impacts, some of that debris may have landed on the moon. Because the lunar surface does not recycle material like Earth does, those ancient Earth rocks could remain there virtually unchanged for billions of years. This opens up the fascinating possibility that the moon may be holding ancient earth rocks that potentially contain microfossils or chemical signatures, which could shed light on the early history of our planet and the origins of life. The challenge, however, is finding them. These tiny fragments would be scattered randomly across the lunar surface. One strategy might be to search for hydrated minerals, which are abundant on earth, but extremely rare on the moon. Finding such materials could be a clue pointing to terrestrial origin, so we are trying to do all of that, but with a much tighter budget. That means we have to plan carefully and be smart about how we move forward. We also want to make everything a lot safer, not just for the astronauts, but also to reassure the public. That is why we are running hundreds of tests on the ground before sending anyone up. Of course, that means things will move a lot slower than they did during Apollo, but that is okay. If we waited 50 years to go back to the moon, we can wait a few more to make sure we do it right. And this time, the United States is not the only one in the race. China is pushing hard with its own ambitious lunar plans. Hopefully, that competition will light a fire under the U.S. again, just like it did back in the 1960s. And maybe, just maybe, we will witness another miracle on the moon. If you have watched this far, I truly appreciate your time and interest. I am glad to know that this video has been helpful to you. We are on our way to reaching our goal of 10,000 subscribers, so feel free to support us by hitting that subscribe button. It really helps a lot. Thank you.